Hello everyone. I hope you're all well and thank you for joining me today for today's session, Creating Learning That Sticks. Now, the session today will last about 30 minutes, so please feel free to type any questions in the Q&A chat box. Um, I will get to those at the end. So before we start off, let me tell you a little bit about uh, myself and the session first. I've worked in L&D for many years. Um, the last eight years I've been with GRC Solutions as a learning consultant. GRC is a training provider that mainly focuses on mandatory learning. So I'm one of those lucky ones who works closely enough with, with clients and really gets an insight into their organizations, see some of the problems they face and help them develop creative solutions. I work with organizations in uh, Australia, New Zealand, Singapore and the US. Now, in my conversation with clients, I often get asked the question, what is everyone else doing? In fact, I've been asked that so many times over the past few months that I thought it really warranted another website, another webinar session. So today, what I'd really like to talk about is share the latest buzz around the industry. So what is everyone doing? There's as you probably know, there's a buzz around developing learning that is to the point and that encourages behavioral change. So we've been aiming for this for so long and credit to all of you and your hard work. I feel we're finally getting there. So the focus is once again on the basics of good training. So relevance over comprehensive, simplicity over bells and whistles, and practical over thought leadership. Now, if anything, the, I want this session also to be practical. I think training should be practical um, and also this, this, this workshop. So please let me know if you have any questions. Um, it's a short session. It's only, like I said, about 20 to 30, 30 minutes. Um, so we'll be focusing on what is everyone doing? How can you create a meaningful message? Common pitfalls and distractors to avoid? And when is it successful? So just a little bit of background. The development of training requirements is fascinating. I've seen the nature of workplace training completely change in the past eight years. When I first started, training courses were really heavy handed. Some were as long as four hours and Everyone was made to do it. It was really that ticker box thinking. Then the GFC hit, budgets were slashed in half, and the, the focus was really on cost. Everything had to be done as cheap as possible. Companies also realized that what they were doing didn't really have the desired behavioral change. So that's where the involvement of L&D and instructional design became much larger and the conversation got really serious. Technological advances then followed each, other, followed each other quickly and today we're looking at an entirely new landscape. If you look at gamification, for example, it's been popular for a few years. It's great. I really think it's great, but it's also incredibly expensive to create. Um, I don't think it's always the best for mandatory learning because you're looking at legal updates and um, uh, policy policy updates that really needs to change and, and, and flex with with all of those um, all of those demands from from an organisation. But it's gamification is really effective on a large scale of, of content. Um, interestingly, we're also seeing a lot of um, talk about virtual reality at the moment, which is really exciting. At the last iDesign X conference, just a few months ago, many people were talking about this. And I think in the next year, maybe two years, we will really start to uh, see that take off. Mobile learning is now also finding its place as a learning feature. I think perhaps in the beginning, it was touted as the golden bullet for a while, um, but most, most employers are also recognizing that they can't expect employees to spend the commute or their evening at home doing training. It's now expected as a standard feature, which is great, but it's really not the be all and end all to creating good, good learning.
So what is the industry doing now? What is everybody talking about? What we're seeing now is a combination of learning approaches. We know that blended learning is very effective and this follows a very similar thought process. So if you look at adaptive learning, at GRC we have been working with the pioneers of adaptive learning in the US and we were the first ones who've applied it to mandatory and compliance training in, in Australia. So how adaptive learning works is that you enter a course, um, you go through a number of test questions and then depending on your answer, you will skip certain learning outcomes or you'll go through them if you got the answers wrong. It cuts down learning time enormously. I've heard of one organization with about 20,000 staff worldwide who managed to cut down one single course from over two hours to 20 minutes. I mean, just imagine how much lost productivity that was for that, for that organization. So yeah, adaptive is great really for, for two things. It's great for RPL, so that's recognition of prior learning and personalized learning. Um, adaptive is great for core learning. It's great for mandatory learning. It's really good for learning that has to be transmitted and can't be cut down. Um, a while ago, we were approached by a financial services client who really wanted to, to have lots of short modules. They were sick of having those long courses and they felt staff was, was burdened with too much training. They decided they wanted really short, sharp, five to 10 minute modules for all staff. Then as we started going through all the content, we realized there was just too much important information that you couldn't cut out. So in the end, we moved, moved to adaptive. So this client now had all their mandatory training going through adaptive, but they were still open to creating short, sharp pieces of learning. Now, we now know that having a combination of learning modes is the best way to, to ensure retention. Look at marketing-based learning, for example. That's a really good example. So campaign-based learning has its roots in marketing. Marketing specialists know how important it is that people retain a message. And often it's due to repeat exposure to a message. We call that reiterative learning in L&D, not repetitive learning, mind you. Um, so the, the, the better a message is retained, the more likely a consumer will remember a product and buy it next time they see it. So here's the opportunity to focus on ongoing training. So you have information that needs relaying throughout the year and these snippets are designed to meet a specific learning outcome and reinforces these messages in a few minutes. So for example, how do you want your employees to deal with customer complaints? Well, just set out the guidelines in a few easy steps. Or is cyber security an area of risk? Then you can have five minute pieces of learning that focuses on email phishing, or you can focus on information that needs relaying throughout the year such as messages from the board, uh, legal requirements that take effect, those sorts of things. It's really good for offsetting the challenges of short attention spans while offering ongoing training on the job. So the short length, it means you also don't have to worry too much about completion rates either. So whenever I evaluate learning programs with clients, we always see that micro learning is done pretty much instantly. It has the highest completion rates. Most organizations, it's close to 100%. And it also has the highest satisfaction rates, which is really crucial to success. Here we go. So, how do you create a meaningful message and behavioral change? I think it really rests on four pillars, with the first one being relevance, and probably the most important ones as well. Relevance, I think with every 
piece of learning we create, everything we do, we must ask ourselves, this, this person who works in this department, do they need to know this? Will they understand what I'm trying to say here? One of my first, I've used this example before, but one of my first jobs was writing content for a women's magazine. And in the office, they had a profile of the, of the average reader that was visible to everyone. Everyone had a printout of the, the reader, average reader profile. So it covered her age, what she liked, uh, what her family situation was, the type of work she did, her hobbies, the brand she liked, the whole lot. So whenever you wrote, you were looking at this person thinking, okay, does that tick the boxes? Yes or no? They also spoke to their readers often just to make sure that the, they were covering relevant topics that was interesting. And the editor always said that that was the key to their success. And that's really what we should be doing as well. We should, we should be looking at our employees that make, make sure that our message is tailored to what they need to know and talk to them as well, see where their, where their difficulties are. More recently, we worked with a client who completely understood this. They created 14 version of, versions of one course just to make sure it was dealing directly with issues each business unit was facing. I mean, imagine 14 versions of one course. It was so much work. But then the outcome was fantastic. It was a really successful course. So if there's one thing I'd like you to remember at the end of this, of this session is focus on your audience. So do you have a one-size-fits-all or do you have role-specific? Role specific means creating relevant training, making content interesting. Also, it actually also deals with employee backlash. I found this on a forum a while back. A, an anonymous bank employee wrote, they are making me do really boring training at work right now in case I need to spot money laundering. It is possibly the most boring thing ever and doesn't apply to my job at all. Distract me, please. Now, one look at the media shows that money laundering training is totally relevant to anyone who works in a bank. However, the training this employee was doing just wasn't well designed. It didn't pull out the relevant parts. I think this this person was feeling completely bombarded with the information they were getting and the, the, the relevant message, what they needed to know to be able to help them in their jobs, just wasn't coming across. So again, relevance. The second one, second pillar, simple, is probably, certainly, one of the most difficult ones. Simple often gets confused with easy but it's not, it's actually the hardest. It's developing a simple course is harder than a four hour course. It needs good research, it needs good writing, it needs great storytelling and really good design. It is challenging. You should never underestimate your people's intelligence, but the challenge is to distill your training so that the key messages don't get lost. Very, very difficult and very, yeah. Practical and timely. Practical, so what are your takeaway points? What are action items after a meeting? So when you develop your content, make sure at the, at the end you've got a little page saying, right, when you go back to your desk, remember this, 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 and this. It's really like the action items after a meeting. What do you want someone to remember or do? Timely, what's happening in the organization? Look at the news. What's happening around us right now? What can we use in our learning? On the uh, front page of the ABC News website this morning, I saw the story about my health record. Use that. It's the perfect introduction to explaining privacy and the importance of safeguarding personal information. So look around for, very, uh, for, for timely subjects that you can use in your, in your training. Cognitive ease. Now, cognitive ease is a, is a, is a very difficult, um, complex topic where we can talk about for, for hours. But it's, it's basically the, 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 
the feeling that makes you feel more favorable towards things that are familiar, that are easy to understand and easy to see or read. Um, so that feel, this feel-good response comes from an uh, unconscious part of our brain. So it's familiarity in design. So when you design a course, use corporate colors, uh, design, tone of voice, but also familiar faces. Can you use one of your colleagues to share a story? It's really about um, reaffirming the familiarity the, 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 in the organization. It falls under distractors. First one, beware the bells and whistles. So this is really where it often, often goes wrong, where training gets that was developed with the best intentions sort of misses misses the misses the outcomes completely the bells and whistles are to enhance your message not to create it so stick to your message and remember the basics of good learning that's also why face to face training is so effective it focuses on the message only last summer I bought an aircon for the house and it came with all sorts of bells and whistles. Now, I don't want the bells and whistles. I don't want the features that track my movement. I just want a cool house when it's 40 degrees outside. That's the main thing. If there's any features that enhance that, then it's, then it's fine. But really, it should just do what it's set out to do. Second one, choose your author wisely. Wrong author. So that's really about the wrong author for the audience. And this is a this is a tricky one because often when we create content, we need to rely on subject matter experts. Yet very few people are experts in their field as well as trainers. So if you find yourself in a situation that you have to rely on, on experts for your content, make sure you have a good good editing team. When, um, when I started um, with, with GRC and first started working on, on compliance content, I, I, f I felt a little bit like a fraud because it was, it was written by all these really amazing, talented lawyers who distilled reams of, of, of what to me was jargon into, into a course. And I was coming from a, from a perspective that I was really... Like everyone else, I didn't know much about the topic. Later on, I realized how important it was that I was there because even though the initial message was there, it still didn't have the practical outcomes for, the, for everyone within the organization. So my role was crucial in translating and making the messages that were in, that dis in the content that was written by the SMEs, really making it practical for the for the for the end people the end users so again if you if you're working with more complex topics make sure you have a, a good editing team who can make it relevant again the word relevant um, to those to those employees who who study it in the end one chef in the kitchen ah oh, don't get me started on this one too many cooks Recently, we worked with a client where a piece of training had to be signed off by legal, HR, L&D, and compliance. One department said the content was too light. The other one said it was too dense and it had too much jargon. One department said it was too freely interpreted. And the other one said, it followed company policy too much. Now, as you, as you see, the type of feedback I was getting was directly opposing the other ones. It was, it was very difficult to get that, to get that right. Um, one, I mean, this is, this is a tiny example, but <clears throat> when we first got it back, one of the, um, one of the departments wanted double spaces throughout, throughout the course. So we added in double spaces everywhere. And then the second reviewer wanted everything taken out again. We ended up adding and removing double spaces five times. 
I mean, I'm joking about it now, but seriously, it's it's also a scenario where you've been planning your your training and you're handing it over and it's, you're seeing it being ripped to, to threads and that's not good. So when you work on training, make sure that you have one person, a reviewer, a stakeholder on board, on site, who has the final say in the authority to vet all the comments and also to make sure that they're on board and understand what you're trying to do with your, with your training. Create your course with a version two in mind. Now, everything changes, language changes, learning changes, as we've seen. So when you create a course, think, next year, how can I change this? Keep your training up to date with, I don't know, new examples, new cases. Same old, same old is just not good enough. I do volunteer training, or I have been doing volunteer training for the last three years. And part of the, part of the, um, the annual process is that I have to do an e-learning course at the start of each, each calendar year. Um, and every year that training is the same. Now I've, I see hundreds and hundreds of training training courses and quiz questions over the year. But when I see that one, I still remember last year's examples. I st even still remember the quiz questions. Um, so it's important. If that happens to me, I'm sure it'll happen to your employees as well. So make sure you keep things fresh and, and change them around just so, so that people go, oh, this is different. So... We've, we've just we just spoke a little bit about um, creating content that that sticks. So really de developing relevant, good con content that has the best outcomes for the employees. But we also need to need to consider the organisation as wider as well, because there's also external factors that really influence the success of a training of a piece of training. Um, when we work closely together with organizations, we usually see that the, that the organizations who have really good outcomes have things like stakeholder buy-in. So they have, um, they have, they have supporters um, who, who really stand behind, behind the project and help and push thing, things along. Um, often training is linked to, to, to training and, and development plans of the, of the employees. Again, that really helps. Management endorsement, again, so important. So as soon as the, as the person at the top starts talking about the advantages or the benefits or the importance of the training, it just trickles down. Everyone immediately or much more easily jumps on, jumps on boards. And I think the fourth one, available resources, that's really about your people and your budgets. It's, um, yeah, I think that's the, the crucial bit to, to any project. But again, when you start your project, ha, um, assess if you've got enough people to do, to do the development and do you have enough money to, to get it all finished up. Okay. Look, this is really all we have time for today. Does everyone, anyone have a question? Just going to have a look now here, my Q&A box. Okay, yeah. I've got a question here that says, will these resources be made available to all attendees? Yes, yes, all the, um, the presentation will be sent out to everyone uh, shortly and we will be adding a recording of this webinar to our GRC YouTube channel. Again, we'll, uh, we'll distribute that. Uh, let, well, we'll send the link out to everyone today. Okay, any further questions? No, I can't see any further questions. Thank you all very much for your time. I know this webinar is only short, but please feel free to get in touch if you have any further questions 
or if you'd like to know s some more about the type of work we do. Um, I always love to help. So over here, you've got my email address and my direct number. So please just give me a call if there's anything I can, I can help with. So yes, again, thank you so much for your time. I really hope you found it useful. And um, I look forward to seeing you at our next webinar. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your day. Bye-bye.